kind of Bible study. We in Genesis chapter nine tonight. Genesis chapter nine. Okay. Uh, well, as you can see, we've got the additional lighting in here, and not just for the better film quality, but also hopefully you know to help you see better uh, there. It helps me. It gives me a lot of good light here. Uh, I've redone the uh, color scheme and font colors on the PowerPoint. So let me know. I need some feedback on that. We normally do the black screen with the white, you know, letters. So let me know as we go through this if it's easier to read, worse, you know, or so forth. So we can adjust that and <clears throat> make sure, you know, that it's easy to read and so forth. Uh, we've got about, well, after tonight, we'll have about two more weeks in this study. We're only going to go through Genesis chapter 11 in this. Uh, and after we uh, get finished with that, we're uh, more than likely, what I'm preparing for is to go into the book of Romans. And we're going to see all of this stuff we've been studying that's been kind of really just groundwork. We're going to see all of that begin to come together. And uh, it's going to be a little, a little different. We're going to kind of shift in the way we do things. We won't move near as fast. It's going to really slow down and, you know, really be some good Bible study. Uh, more, uh, you know, I'm going to continue to use the PowerPoint, but we're going, you know, make sure you bring your Bible because we're going to just, you know, use our Bibles. Here's, I like using the PowerPoint because it's, it keeps things moving a little faster. You can cover a lot more scripture. You can cover a lot more ground using the PowerPoint. But the downside to using this is that we read the scriptures up here, but we don't really get them in place here physically in the book. So it's important that we uh, know where, you know, it's important that we read the Scriptures also in the, in the Bible itself so that we, we relate to where they are in relation to each other and, you know, what books and so forth like that. And, uh, it helps our Bible navigation to be able to remember where that verse was and what were we talking about last week and we can, you know, go to it and find it and so forth. So we're, we're going to, do more of that when we get out of this study and move forward. But we'll, you know, we'll be going uh, a lot slower. I mean, there will be weeks when we may take one verse, and that's that's really as far. Of course, we may go all over the Bible with that one verse, but you know, that's what we'll do. So, all right, let's get uh, moving here. We got some uh, interesting things to cover tonight. Genesis chapter 9 after the uh, flood we saw last week. Now we're starting over. <clears throat> we see some reminders in this chapter of things that were at the beginning. And uh, remember the, the definition of the word replenish uh, is not as we commonly use it. You know, I've drank all my tea so I need to replenish my... Well, the, the original use of the word meant to fill something up from empty. So when God said, you know, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, it didn't mean refill the earth as the gap theory people, you know, would lead us to believe. And he meant fill it up, you know, populate it from empty because it was empty. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. After they came off the ark and got things going again, and they were ready to get going. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. If you remember... This is the first thing he told Adam and Eve to do. And so he's reminding them, remember, these were your first standing orders. This is what I want for you to do. Multiply and fill up the earth. Populate it with people. Spread out over the earth and so forth. That's what he wanted them to do. As we see there in Genesis 1, verse 26. Over all the fish and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. Uh, and he also said, "And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be shall be upon every beast of the earth, 
and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Do you ever, I mean, seem kind of odd that every, I mean, you know, well, as I think James, or James said over in his book, you know, every type of beast and everything has been tamed by man. We can tame nearly any kind of animal. But we have to tame the animal. When you take any animal, if it's never been exposed to humans, they're scared of people. Everything. Every bird, every reptile, every you know, uh, type of cattle, whatever. All animals, birds, fish, reptiles, everything, are scared of mankind. They may not be scared of each other. You know, you could have different kind of animals out there walking around if they're not, you know, predatory animals. Uh, and they're not scared of each other. But you let a person come out there, phew, they run. So even a dog or a cat that's not, never really been around humans, they tend to be scared of people. You know, what's one of the reasons we keep dogs for? For watchdogs, to bark if somebody comes up that they don't know, you know. Now they may come out there barking and wagging their tail at the same time, but still. Uh, so, uh, and apparently, or we could ask the question, was this the case before the flood? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe before the flood, the fear and dread of man was not upon all the animals and stuff. Uh, they, they may have been tame and, you know, uh, the people may have been able to interact with the animals and, you know, they weren't afraid of them. We don't know. But anyway, after the flood, God said they would be. So, you know, they, the animals would scatter out all over the earth and uh, repopulate it fairly quickly, as God indicated here. And here's something else that was different. Uh, verse 3, He says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is, in, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. This reminds us back in Genesis chapter 1, God's instructions to Adam and Eve. This is God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, you shall be for meat. Meat, of course, in the old English, you used their food. We would say food. It's not specifically, you know, flesh, but meat as used as food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So this leads us to believe, and I think we discussed it a little bit going through here, that before the flood, or in the original creation, God had provided plant food that would provide all of the protein and nutritional uh, needs of every kind of living thing. Uh, even what we think of as meat-eating predators, apparently there was some type of plant food they could eat to get the protein that they needed to you know, to thrive and so forth. So everything, basically, all vegetarian before the flood. <laughs> Not the case after the flood. Now, there's probably some very practical reasons for that. One thing, you know, the, the entire climate of the earth had changed as a result of the flood. Um, when they came out of the ark, yeah, there were some plants beginning to grow, as evidenced by the olive leaf that the dove brought back. But, even if they went out there, and let's say they, they landed when it was springtime, okay, still, they would have to plant crops, and it would still be several months before they could harvest those crops. So, unless they still had a lot of food stored in the ark, you know, left over, uh, they were going to run pretty slim on something to eat. So, there are a combination of factors that probably came together which was the reason why God changed their diet where now they could eat meat. They you know, use animals for food. Uh, said, but don't eat anything with its blood. And we know that was in, you know, carried over. That was in the law of Moses. Also, that was in the instructions given to the Gentile believers when Paul went back to Jerusalem 
And he had that meeting with James and Peter and, and all those, you know, and they tried to say, okay, obvious that the Gentiles are coming into the body of Christ. Uh, they're being saved. They're receiving the Holy Spirit just like we are. What are we going to do with these Gentiles? We can't put them under the law. That Our fathers couldn't keep the law, neither can we. So what are we going to do with these Gentiles? James said, well, here's, here's the four things we need to tell them to do. Uh, don't uh, you know? Don't make sacrifices to idols. Uh, don't eat things with the meat with the blood in it, or things strangled, and abstain from fornication. Those, those four things uh, that the Gentiles were instructed to do. So we we find a carryover principle all the way through. God did not want anybody to eat anything with its blood in it. So anyway, and that goes into all the with the dietary laws and kosher stipulations and so forth. But after the flood, they can eat meat. Now, God reminds them also of their accountability and of how it was at the beginning. Remember these things that God's saying to them here in Genesis chapter 9, after they've gone through the flood, after they landed, they've come out of the ark, and it's time to start over again. He's not really giving them new instructions. He's just reminding them of how it was in the beginning. He says, And surely your blood and your lives will I require... At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So God's reminding them of their accountability to one another. Uh, he's not setting down some hard and fast laws of retribution. Remember, the revenge and vengeance retribution culture apparently was the main factor in the explosion of violence in the pre-flood world. Remember, Cain was afraid that as he went off, whoever finds me, he is going to kill me. And then down the line from him... Uh, there was one man, Lamech, not Noah's father, Lamech, but another Lamech, and you know he had killed a man, and he told his wife, "I'm afraid, you know, uh, retaliation will be against me. If it was against Cain seven times, it'll be against me seventy times." So apparently, there was this culture of revenge and rep retribution going on before the flood. Well, after the flood, God reminds them of those things, but He also reminds them of their accountability and uh, moving them away from, okay, while establishing the principle of capital punishment for murder, which here again is another really carryover principle we see, you know, all the way through. Uh, <clears throat> not setting down just hard and fast laws of retribution, but reminding them of their accountability to one another, okay, where he, he makes the statement, I'll, at the hand of every beast will I require, at the hand of man, every man's brother will I require the life of man. And then, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. <clears throat> Reminder that life was valuable to God should also be valuable to them. Allowing for capital punishment as you know punishment for murder, yet wanting to you know, remind them of their accountability to one another and not to get back into that culture of retribution and vengeance and so forth like that. This also is a reminder where he says the hand of uh, man and beast I will require it. God using them as agents to execute judgment should He choose to on those who began to restart the wanton murder and violence that was before the flood. Remember back when we were studying the cycles of judgment? Remember the third cycle of judgment when the prophet Elisha came in? You remember what uh, as we found in Leviticus 26? What God said He would do? If they walked contrary to him, the third cycle of judgment began, and uh, Elisha came on the scene. The 
kids ran out of the city, you know, mocking him and so forth. The two female bears came out of the wood and killed 42 of them. That was, that was this right here, this, this happening, that uh, God would use wild beasts if He so desired to execute judgment on people. So anyway, uh, just some points there. And some of that could be kind of confusing or we could tend to take that and try to turn that into some hard and fast laws of retribution. That's not what we've got here. It's more of a reminder of accountability. God had held Cain accountable for the life of his brother. Remember back in Genesis 4, verse 9, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, you are your brother's keeper. He was accountable to his brother to look out for one another. Somehow or other, you know, they missed that somewhere. Or he did anyway. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. See, it's accountability. That God keeps count. And we talked about this. One reason why the ground was corrupt. Even the earth itself was corrupt before the flood. Because of the innocent blood that had been shed. And poured into the ground and it became corrupt because of that. So there's an accountability there. And at the end, when all those judgments take place and everything, God will bring all that into account. All that innocent blood that hasn't been you know, forgiven and so forth. Uh, uh, because there's accountability. So now art there a curse from the earth which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. <clears throat> Alright. Then he tells them again. And you, to Noah, mainly Noah's sons, Noah never had any more children after this point. But it's, it's such that you be fruitful, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. So here's another reminder of their standing orders that they are supposed to go over all the earth and populate it and multiply it and uh, live in the earth. God created the earth for people to live in. That's what He meant for them to do. Now, we get into a section where He begins to talk about the, the covenant He made with not just Noah, we, a lot of times we call it the Noahic covenant. But really it's with all living things that He would not destroy the earth with a flood anymore. Genesis 9-8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Now, we've talked about the covenants before, mainly the covenants with Israel. We've also discussed at length in uh, courses past how that, according to we, as what we see in Ephesians chapter two verse twelve, those those of us that are Gentiles, we were you know without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and, and all those things. So there never were any covenants covenants with us as far as the ones that were to Israel. But this covenant covers all human beings. This, this applies to us and to everybody. And not just people, but look what it says. Hey, he said, your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So God very specific. And it's interesting in this chapter 9, he really spends a lot of time on this covenant that he makes with every living thing that he would not destroy the earth anymore with the waters of a flood. Um, there are a lot of interesting things about some of the most ancient archaeological sites in the world. One of them, of course, is Babylon. And as we'll see in like a, oh, a chapter 11, I think, we look at the Tower of Babel. What they believe to be the, at least the remains of the Tower of Babel is still there. Uh, there's uh, one of the most well-known, very ancient archaeological site called uh, Tepe Gara in Turkey. And 
dominant feature of this archaeological site is the remains of a, the base of a huge tower. It, as they believe, at one time there was a, a huge, or they built a huge and tall tower there. There's a, a one school of thought among at least biblical archaeologists that uh, these ancient cultures built high towers because they didn't believe this. It's like the Tower of Babel. What did they say? Well, it's built as a tower to the heaven, you know, and so forth like that. High tower. Because they wanted to try to, you know, build to get out of the flood if the flood, if, if there was ever a flood. Well, God told them that He made a covenant with them that there would never be a flood of water to destroy the earth ever again. So, there was some... Uh, Sign archaeological evidence of disbelief of this covenant right here. But this covenant covers all of us. I mean, this applies to every human being, every animal, everything, birds and all, right down, all the way to the end of the earth. And God, you know, as uh, Peter describes, destroys it with fire and renovates the earth. Okay, <clears throat> verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Now, this was a new thing that they had never seen because remember, before the flood, it didn't rain. The Bible tells us that a mist rose up from the ground and watered all the plants. So they had apparently, I don't know, you know, if you go with the, the canopy theory that there was a, a crystalline water or ice canopy surrounding the earth, a lot of good reason to believe that to have been the case. And that canopy disappeared during the floods where a lot of the you know, rain water came from. But regardless, it didn't rain on the earth until after the flood. And so we know that, you know, the rainbow and the rain's falling through the through the air and sunlight passes through it, we get all the spectrum of colors, you know, which rainbow. So God set that there and he told him, This is my token to you. This is a reminder to you that from now on there will never be a flood of waters to destroy the earth ever again. The rainbow. Now, there's a picture of a rainbow. I wish you could have been there that day with us because there were actually three rainbows visible there. Now, is interesting thing, and I could have, I could have found probably. I know Julie's got better rainbow pictures. She's got pictures of entire, you know, from one end to the other rainbows. But I chose this one. <laughs> For a particular reason, this rainbow picture was taken during the excavation in Colorado. And we uh, were, I think, well, it had rained us out. The reason, we were, we were down off the mountain, down at, at our camp. We were down there in the storms, of, you know, passing to the east. And as the, the storms went over the mountain ridge where we'd been digging, well, and we had these rainbows, these three rainbows. And we all, I don't know if we all kind of thought about it at the same time, but we discussed, you know, here we are, we're <laughs> excavating evidence of the creatures that were destroyed and buried during the flood. And here we have God's token that He would never destroy the earth of the flood again. So, uh, man, that's the, you know, kind of an irony, I guess you'd say. It was an interesting thing. So, there's a story behind this, this photo right here. It's not just, a, not just a rainbow. But anyway, that was an interesting thing. We discussed that. And, uh, you know, the thing about the rainbow, every, uh, every time we see one, you know, and it's there when... Uh, kids, you know, uh, they ask us about rainbows. Well, that's an opportunity to tell people the story 
of you know Noah's flood, Noah and the flood, and things like that. Now, every covenant had a, some kind of accompanying token, like a physical thing to 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 like a ver to verify the covenant, or as a, a reminder of the covenant. Uh, the post flood covenant that God would not destroy the world with a flood anymore had a rainbow. The Abrahamic covenant God made with him, I'll make of you a great nation and so forth. I'll give you the land for an everlasting covenant and so forth. He gave him the sign of circumcision uh, as the Abrahamic the token of the Abrahamic covenant. And the Levitical Mosaic covenant we find in Exodus 19. Uh, they had the law and the tabernacle and things like that. They, you know, they were also verifying signs God gave them to, uh, you know, verify His covenant with them under the law. Also, the blessings and so forth. So if you hearken to my voice and follow my law, I'll bless you. If you don't listen to me and you don't follow my commandments, I'll put these curses on you and so forth. Uh, the Davidic covenant had the token of an everlasting kingdom. That everlasting kingdom was instituted, but it was not completed. And it will not be completed until the King of Kings completes it when He comes again and brings His kingdom. As we saw uh, during uh, when John the Baptist came on the scene, he began to preach, Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Jesus came right behind John. He said, Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so the nation of Israel was offered the kingdom at that time. They, of course, rejected it and so forth. God suspended their program and uh, brought in the dispensation of grace. Uh, the Messianic covenant also... The, the token of that is, is victory over his enemies. We find the Messianic covenant in Psalm 110 where God says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that's the token that has been initiated because Christ at this time is seated at the right hand of the Father where he will remain until it is time for him to return, arise from his place fulfilling Scripture, and come again to put his foot on the neck of his enemies at the Battle of Armageddon and so forth. Uh, so victory over it, that's a token. Has it? It's been initiated but not completed. It will be completed by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And then the New Covenant, uh, the token of that is Christ's blood. Remember there at the Last Supper when uh, Jesus was with the man, He took the cup and He said, This is the New Covenant in My blood and so forth, just shed for you, and so forth. Now, the New Covenant, here again, uh, not specifically for us. Uh, we have a place in that, but we have to remember that you know, the Old Covenants were for Israel. The New Covenant specifically is for them too. It's promised to them. We come in under a different deal. Reconciliation as enemies of God, reconciled by the death of His Son, and given hope of eternal life by His resurrection. So, Anyway, I just wanted to put this in there. There's accompanying tokens with the uh, covenants. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 9. God said, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it and may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh, this is upon the earth. God said unto Noah, This is a token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah. And get this, this is a, a, the rest of this sentence, the rest of this verse 19 is one of those watershed division verses that sheds a lot of you know people that believe the Bible from people who don't believe the Bible. It says, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So as 
I believe that the Bible is literally true in its details and in its historic account. I believe that all human beings are descended of these three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I got a very interesting book. I uh, probably should have seen if I could have gotten copies of it. I'll see if I can get copies of this book. It's an interesting book uh, that you might be interested to read. It's called The uh, 16 Ancestors of Mankind. And it goes over the 16 grandsons of Noah and how all of the nations spread out from them and so forth. They really, you know, after the Tower of Babel, they really spread out fairly quickly over the whole earth. But another thing, go ahead, go ahead. Question. Okay. Ham is the father of Canaan, right? Uh huh. So when the Israelites, and I don't know if I'm something, but the Israelites were in captivity for those 400 years, and then God told them, once you leave, you need to conquer this land where these people are. Yep. Aren't they, in a sense, basically going after family? They were related, yeah. They were related down the line, sure were. Yeah. But then, you know, I mean, really, if you go back far enough, all of us are. Right. <laughs> you know? So, so yeah, they were. Um, I mean, the the Shemites or the you know the Semites, the Jews, Israelites that eventually became the Israelites. Yeah, they were you know they were related back to Ham, back to the Canaanites. But uh, it's kind of like, well, I don't know really what to compare it to, but uh, by by that point. <coughs> You know, they were far enough apart so that they really, other than a, a common uh, descendancy back, ancestry back there, they really didn't recognize each other. Oh, okay, here's a good modern day illustration. Uh, the Muslims and the Jews today, they all trace their origin back to Abraham. It was Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. The Jews descended from Isaac. The, most of the Arab tribes that are the you know, uh, ancestors of the modern day uh, Arabs you know, and Muslim nations descended from Ishmael. So they both trace their lineage back to Abraham. And uh, so and essentially, yeah, they're, you know, they're relatives. <laughs> so how do you get two-faced? You get Muslim and then you get the other one. How do you know which is which? Separate faiths. All right. If they descended from the same person. The. Uh, Were they grown up with the same belief system? Well, not really. Uh, from what I understand, the religion that became Islam. Um, basically was a carryover from ancient Babylon and Persia, uh, some Greece. Okay, the, the Arab peoples before Muhammad and Islam were uh, disjointed groups. I mean, they were basically, you know, related in ancestry. But they basically had a pantheon of different gods. They were idolaters. The uh, tribe of Muhammad, which was the Quraysh tribe, they worshipped the moon god of Babylon. You ever wonder why the symbol of Islam is a crescent moon and a star? Well, that goes all the way back to ancient Babylon. Now, the Muslims will deny it. They give some other explanation for that. But... But the, the, the Muhammad's original tribe, they worshipped a lot of gods, but their main god was the moon god of ancient Babylon. So all of those Arab peoples that weren't Jewish, they were still worshipping those same old like Molech and Chemosh and all those old Babylonian Baal worship and all those pagan gods. They were still worshipping those same gods. It might have been under different names, but it was still the same. Up until, and here's, here's what really Muhammad did. What he accomplished was he took from out, out of his tribe and he 
change their belief into a monotheistic belief, belief in one God, which you know they call Allah. Uh, it's not the God of the Bible, though. You know, some people will try to make you believe that it is not the same. It you know be traced back to the ancient moon god of Babylon. So anyway, that's basically what funneled down to over the ages. Same old pagan religions, shuffling around, stirring around, you know, same gods, different names. Finally came down. Uh, Muhammad changed that, brought out the religion of Islam, one God, and so the people that followed him, they became monotheistic, just worshiped one God, God Allah, threw off all their old pagan, uh, you know, religions and things, uh, and so forth. They, that's kind of in a nutshell what I understand of how Islam came about. Does that kind of answer your question? All right. The verse 19 kind of begins that whole sort of seed theory you know, to me that, you know, they all came from Noah. They couldn't be another source of mankind. Right, right. He managed to read them. Right, right. So yeah, this this kind of, the, the whole Nephilim thing that there's a demon seed and it passed through and they restarted again and all that. This is very specific. From Noah's three sons, human beings with human wives, <laughs> the whole earth was, you know, was spread out. You know, in the next couple of chapters, especially chapter 10, we'll look at that specifically. And I know it's kind of one of those chapters that gets into a lot of this and we get that one and so forth. But, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of put that together. It's really pretty uh, informative. It may not be extremely interesting, but it's very informative. Now, there's a phrase in here that we need to keep in mind because it's important to understand what's coming up later. Okay. The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Simple, clear statement. And Ham is the father of Canaan. I got to thinking, why is that statement in there? Why is that relevant to why why is that relevant to this? Why is that statement in there? Why is it relevant to, to any of this? Well, it's not necessarily relevant to this. It's giving us a piece of information that we're going to need coming up. Also, remember this. We have to keep in mind the word usage of a father. It doesn't just mean that Canaan was his, you know, progeny, his offspring. Not that he's just the physical father of Canaan. It means that what Canaan became, he became that way because Ham taught him that. All of the pagan idolatry that was inherent in the Canaanite tribes, Ham was the father of that. we got some examples here. Let's look. Uh, back in Genesis 4, we have a couple of examples of the word usage of that father. Ada bear Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. That doesn't mean that during those times every person who lived in a tent or had cattle was directly his offspring. Some of them were. But it means he was the originator of that. He, he started that and, and he uh, originated a group of people like a, a tribe or a culture of tent-dwelling cattle raisers in those days before the flood. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. So here again, we have the same usage of that word. doesn't mean that, that everybody that played a musical instrument uh, was his son or daughter, but he originated that, you know, the probably manufacture and use of musical instruments. And also Paul gives an example of this word usage. Uh, here in Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham. He says, He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, <coughs> which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Now remember, here in Romans, and by chapter 4, and we'll, we'll look at all this when we get in Romans, but by chapter 4, uh, Paul's talking to Jew and Gentile. There's some things in Romans We'll look at this, like I said, when we get over there. Some of it's to Jews, some of it's to Gentiles, some of it's to both. Uh, we're members of the body of Christ. But 
He said that he might be the father of all that would believe, though they be not circumcised, we know that's Gentiles, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Now here, he, he uses the word our father Abraham as a Jew talking to Jews. Their physical you know, descent, uh, uh, ancestor Abraham. So anyway, this just, I didn't want to go way all into this uh, right now. We don't have time tonight, but I wanted to look at this as an illustration of the word usage of that father. So that we, when we see Ham was the father of Canaan, it means more than that he was just his physical father. Now, back to Genesis chapter 9. Noah began to be a husbandman. And we know that specifically means he began to grow vine, uh, grapevine. He planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. Now, we can understand by this that this is several years have gone by. You know, this wasn't the two weeks after they left the ark. This is years down the line. So and so forth. Uh, Noah, you know, drank too much. He got drunk and whatever, thrashing around in his tent and threw off all of his clothes. So here's a, you know, 620 or 30 year old naked man laying in his tent. <laughs> now, this gets into an intriguing thing that, that can be a little difficult to kind of piece together, but I think we can when it comes to understanding of this. And Ham, the father of Canaan, Remember that phrase again. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So the whole kind of premise of this situation here is disrespect of their, of their father. You know, and even in the law of Moses, we saw... A lot of instructions about how it was, you know, defiling and it was wrong to see the nakedness of your parents or your aunt or uncle or your brother or sister or, or you know, on and on. So it was a, it was a, a disrespectful thing and a humiliating kind of thing to happen. And uh, you know, even in their day, even before the law, it was customary for them. It was the wrong thing, and they understood that. Now. <clears throat> So we find it states, Ham says he saw the nakedness of, the, of his father and told his two brethren of that. Here's the question we come to. I probably should read the next verse uh, first. Yeah, let me go ahead and go here. Verse 24, Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. Uh, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So, let's take a look at this. It says that, let me get over here to my notes. Um, first of all, keyword saw. So apparently, and I, I looked all this up in the you know dictionaries and all that stuff. It gives us a sense of that he, he didn't, it, it just reading this on the surface, we could easily get the idea that you know they're going about their business and what and whatnot. Uh, you know, Ham is going to go into Noah's tent for some reason or other, or whatever. He opens the tent flap, goes in there, and there's Noah passed out, drunk, naked. It's, you know, like that. Oh man. His brothers are outside. What's the matter with you? Man, you're never going to believe what I just saw. You know, I'll never get that image out of my mind. And it wasn't like that. It wasn't like he just made a mistake and so on. Apparently, he uh, looked on his father and in saying something to his brothers, there had to have been something taking place that was very disrespectful, um, Humiliating, degrading, something like that. Had to have been more to it. Now, Josephus writes that uh, 
you know, that kind of was the case. Uh, there are some writers that, and I don't necessarily agree with it, that it kind of allude to the possibility that there was some defiling act went on with Noah when he was drunk. I don't think that's the case. I think it's more of like a humiliating type of deal. Now, so, if it was here, and here's the question, this always bothered me. If it was Ham that went in the tent of his father and saw him naked, why did Noah curse Canaan? Why did he curse Ham? And it was obvious he didn't. He cursed Canaan and all of his descendants. Now, we have some we have some clues here that I think we can uh, kind of get some understanding from. First of all, it says here, Noah awoke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. And I got to thinking about this. Wait a minute. Ham was not Noah's younger son. But Canaan is Ham's youngest son. So that gives us an indication here that when this his says when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son, this his is not signifying Noah's younger son, it's signifying Ham's younger son. Because remember, if we go back up here to verse 22, where you know this situation starts, it's talking about Ham, the father of Canaan, and, and so forth. Uh, so it's an indication there that Noah is referring to Canaan not Ham. Here's another possibility too. It could have been that Canaan had, whether he had, uh, okay. The reason we get the idea that Ham went into the tent and Ham saw uh, Noah naked in there and so forth, but we find Canaan being cursed because of it. It could have been that Canaan may not have been of a, what we think of as a legal age yet. And so Ham kind of bore part of the responsibility of what he had done. So there's, there's reason to believe that it actually was Canaan who saw it and so forth, went into the tent. But it was Ham who kind of bore the brunt because he was the reason why Canaan was like he was and why he turned out like he did and why all of his descendants became completely pagan uh, and every, every tribe, every nation of them that there ever was and so on. So now they uh, you know, don't have any Canaanites anymore. They're an extinct people. Uh, now... Yeah. 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 And also, one of the things God told Abraham when He gave him the prophecy that his descendants would go into Egypt for you know a period of time, four hundred years or so, uh, he he God made a statement to Abraham. He said, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And the Amorites were one of the descendants of Canaan. They were, the Amorites were like the worst of the worst of Satan's people on earth. I mean, completely, totally working with the enemy to fight against everything that, you know, uh, God stood for. Everything uh, uh, that was, you know, good or right. Totally pagan and so forth. So all the Canaanite tribes all became pagans without exception. And so uh, anyway, they were in the land and that's why God sent Israel in there to run them out of the land, to take over their land, to take over that land that He had promised them and uh, wipe out the Canaanites. Uh, and uh, archaeological evidence will bear that out, how wicked they were and so forth. <laughs> So, <clears throat> curse upon Canaan. And the reason why is because they did Ham, Canaan, 
both together somehow or other had something to do with a defiling, humiliating, dehumanizing thing on their father, and he cursed him, right, rightfully cursed him. Remember, Noah also was the prophet of God, God's representative at this time that would pass down to Shem, you know, later on. Uh, Cain shall be his servant, God shall enlarge Jacob, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. That, one of those things about, you know, Japheth, the Gentiles, and dwelling in the tents of Shem. Uh, going over this, I thought of Psalm 91. It says, you know, uh, it just slipped my mind. I guess I ought to look over there. Anyway, Psalm 91 basically says, uh, uh, the psalm that talks about uh, dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and so forth. It is very good. You should read it. We won't turn over there and read it tonight. Go ahead. God shall enlarge Japheth, do you think? Yeah. What does that mean? Did he make a giant? Or? No, I don't think so. It probably he meant the, the tribe, his descendants. Because these were kind of, you know, broad uh, uh, prophecies or blessings over their, them and their descendants. Because remember, this was, this that Noah is saying, these statements here, these blessings and cursings are based on and coming off of what God had said to them. Go into all the earth, be fruitful, and multiply and fill the earth. <laughs> so that was, that was their marching orders from God. That's what they knew they were supposed to do. That was the gospel to them at that time. <laughs> and that's what they were supposed to do. Uh, so that's why... Noah said this, shall enlarge Jacob. That means, you know, enlarge his descendants, his prosperity, his uh, influence over the world. And we know that happened. Japheth was the uh, originator of all of the Gentile peoples, you know. All of us can be traced back to Japheth, you know, uh, because, you know, all of us in here are somehow, you know, European kind of descent in one way or another. And so, verse 28. Noah lived after, lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So, I mean, that's pretty close. Uh, Methuselah lived 969. Noah lived to be 950 years. Uh, and he died. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I have to go. What happened to Ham? It doesn't really mention anything like that. You know. Yeah, well, okay. Who is uh, that coming up here? Yeah, we'll, oh, we'll okay. look at that in chapter oh, okay. 10. Because in chapter 10, we'll look in more detail mm -hmm. about Shem, Ham, and Japheth and who their descendants were and so forth and so on. And there's a couple of interesting things in chapter 10 and a couple of points I want to make that. You know, I'll give you my view, and I think the, the details in the chapter bear it out. Some people would vastly disagree. People in the Young Earth Creation movement would disagree, uh, but I think it bears out. So anyway, some interesting things there in uh, chapter 10 that we'll look at next time. All right, anybody got anything else to add? Take away questions, discussion? All right. I was confused on Verse three, back where you're talking about the wife, I never did grasp that. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Anybody explain that better than I can? It <clears throat> there's a you know a statement in the Bible that the life is in the blood. Now, I guess you could say there are a lot of symbolic things about that. Um, why specifically God would prohibit people from eating the an animal with the blood? Uh, I'm not real sure as far as like practical reasons why. Um, it so, may, may have been to, I don't know, prevent the transfer of disease or something. You know? So they had to like butcher them and bleed out. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. Remember I said, you know, at the last supper, you said, drink this and be my blood. I mean, yeah. Maybe, so don't drink anything else but his blood. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it could be. Could be the only, uh, yeah, the only, uh, uh, you know, blood, even symbolic, they were ever commanded to take part in was uh, Christ's blood. So, yeah. Uh, and it may have been like some of the things we find in the Bible are principles that God incorporated in there because <coughs> He knew what the pagan peoples were going to do with it. So having the, having the foreknowledge and understanding that God had, He, he gave them some prohibitions or it, it could have at least had something to do with why He gave them prohibitions like that. Don't eat things with the blood. Because he knew what the pagan <coughs> people were going to do with them, you know, and uh, and all and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there, and there could be also all right on the statement that the life is in the blood. You know, I know we've had some discussions at times about you know the body and the soul and the spirit and and all those kind of things. What if, and maybe we, we don't know, what if there is some kind of you know, connection between the blood and the Spirit? Maybe that has something to do with why God said the life is in the blood. You know, and we know that physically. If we lose our blood, we lose our life. No questions asked. That's, you know. uh, but we know that in all of the... Well, most of the pagan ritualistic cultures, especially any of the cannibalistic cultures, there's a reason why they ate their enemies and a reason why they drank their blood is because they believed it, it would give them the strength of their enemy spirit. You know? Also, in <coughs> voodoo and uh, other, like, like Santeria and other kind of what we think of as, you know, satanic types of worship, uh, drinking blood is a huge part of their rituals. Part of that is because they believe that when they drink human blood, they're in, in, uh, incorporated with, I guess, demonic power or a strength from demonic beings. So I would say that that probably had a lot to do with why God gave them the prohibition against eating things with the blood. And we know that when uh, James and the apostles told Paul, Go back and tell the Gentiles this. Here's four things. Don't eat anything with the blood. Don't eat anything strangled. Uh, Stain from fornication and all things to do with, with idolatry, basically. Because if they knew that in those pagan cultures that those Gentiles were coming out of, all that satanic stuff was incorporated in that. And so they, they, they knew they had to make a break with that. Uh, so anyway. Carson, could it also be describing the blood uh, is generations per se because uh, you carry the traits of your father. Yeah. And those generations are blood always to me some in some cases, yeah. if you look at it, uh, generation respect, uh, learning knowledge, that type mm -hmm. of thing that's passed on from one to in other words, you might get yeah. Ryan's physical characteristics, mm -hmm. but you also carry some of his uh, what's the word I'm like about? personality, personality traits and things traits. like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. They could be passed from yeah. generation to next. It very well could be. You know, there's a connection to the blood and the soul and the spirit, and it's so you know, there's a there's a lot of things about you know, just just our our blood that we just yet you know beginning to understand even with the DNA yeah, and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, I don't say that's the only that I, we heard a, an interesting story. I'll, I'll end this. I can tell this story pretty quick. Uh, the other day, we heard this story. History. Uh, the lady's name was Henrietta Lack. She was born in around 1920. Dirt poor, barely above slavery, black lady from, I don't know, Mississippi or somewhere uh, down there. Uh, you know, lived in a shack and all that kind of stuff. Had her first child at age 14. Ended up moved to, I think, Baltimore because uh, during those times, the black people could move to the industries and get jobs in the industry and so forth. Steel mill. 
her husband worked it. So anyway, Henrietta Lack was a, she you know, she grew up, had some more kids, went through all kind of hard time, difficult times and things. Uh, very kind lady, took care of people, helped sick people, you know, fed people when they were hungry. Very, very good and kind lady. Anyway, as it come about, in sometime in the 40s, uh, she developed cancer. I think it was uh, cervical cancer. Uh, ended up, she died from it. Uh, when she was in the hospital, shortly before she died, this one particular physician went and uh, took biopsy samples of the cancer and also of her healthy blood cells. Now, here's something I had no idea about. In this story, the guy telling the story stated that uh, up until that time, in all of medical research, they could not get human cells to survive outside of the body. They had tried everything they could possibly think of to try to get human cells to survive outside the body. And so consequently, all of their medical research was extremely limited because they couldn't get human cells to survive outside the body. You know, experiment on animals and all that kind of stuff that they could. When this doctor uh, took samples of Henrietta Lacks tumor in her healthy blood cells, he began to do his research. Uh, research, he noticed that her blood cells had multiplied. And as he began to watch those every day, those cells multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And they began to multiply at a rate far above anything he would have ever expected. Hadn't done anything different than they, what they had done before. And these cells continued to multiply. So he was able to take samples of those, distribute them around other medical, you know, places and so forth. I don't remember all of the facts and dates. I'm going to have to look this up. This is a really interesting story. By, and it, it, she, she passed away in 1951. And I'm thinking that by the 60s, 70s, sometime in there, there were over 20 tons of her living human <coughs> cells, blood cells, that had been distributed all over the world <coughs> for medical research. Uh, the polio vaccine <coughs> was, was possible because of the blood cells of Henrietta Lack. All cancer research would have been impossible had it not been for the blood cells of Henrietta Lack. And so from her, this one lady, blood cells, had gone all over the world and reproduced. And uh, so anyway, just the uh, thought of that story. <laughs> and sometime I would like for you to hear Dr. Ball talking about the amazing physiology and chemistry of blood, especially human blood. Just our, just our blood by itself testifies of the unbelievable and unfathomable wisdom and creativity of our Creator. So and just, just the blood by itself. Amazing things. Anything else? All right. Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed.